how does it feel to get a private lesson, uh, Cheslin, from one of the best players in the world? Honestly, since PogChamps won, like, I, I know this is gonna sound like hella fanboy, but since PogChamps won, like, that's where I really started getting into chess. I was always hoping, please, could it be me that got a lesson? Because I found it so intriguing to just have the one-on-one -on -one time. I know the streams are on and all that. But, like, simply just getting to ask questions uh, to one of the greatest chess minds in the world. Like, it's just an opportunity that, like, you're never gonna have again, right? <laughs> Basically. Okay, so so we'll let's just go through these games like comprehensively. So when you're playing with white, do you have a set opening specifically? Or yeah, I do just... the Spanish. Okay, good. Okay, so one one thing I'm going to say about the Spanish is most people, well, I guess most players are probably going to play this move this night out as opposed to pushing the pawn. Um, but if they do push the pawn, do you know what you're supposed to do here? Where you're supposed to move yeah. the bishop? A four, and then uh, yeah. I'll play C three. You, you can make moves, by the way, on the board as well. So, like, if, if oh, you, yeah. you can also... I, I'm pretty... Yeah, you can. Okay, good. Oh. So, yeah. So, basically, this is what I would say. Is you want to go, like, keep the bishop on the board, and you push the pawn to these two squares. So, let's say black brings the knight oh. out. You play like you did in the game, something like this. Black will develop. And normally, what you do is you want to push the pawn, and your idea is very straightforward here. In that, which... You, yeah. Which are, okay, so let's see if you know what the plans are. Like, now... I, I could push uh, d4 here. Right, but norm uh, normally the first thing you want to do is get your king out of the center of the board. So, like, when you play uh, this opening, the concept is almost always going to be ex exactly the same idea. So you want a castle, they castle. You can't push the pawn because your pawn is hanging on this e4 square. Yeah. So what you want to yeah, do... Yeah, that's true. So, so what, are, what are a couple of ways of bringing pieces more towards the center of the board to support this pawn push? So you want to push the pawn, but your pawn is under attack yeah. right now. So either rook e1 or knight... D2? Yeah, exactly. That's perfect. And the order doesn't really matter, but this is correct. So let's say you play Rook here, you support the pawn. Um, now, normally at some point, what's going to happen when you play this Rui Lopez is your opponent's going to push this pawn. And, yeah, and then... And then you have two options. Um, sorry, you, you, you have these two options. They're both more or less the same, but just, just so that you have a straight, clear, straightforward and clear plan, I'm going to say that you always want to drop the bishop back to the C2 square. Oh, okay. Because the thing is, you can you can put the bishop on the square, um, but the players who are who are stronger in this event will probably understand that when you put the bishop here to try and attack on the diagonal, black can move the knight to this this square. Yeah, that's true. And so generally, what what I would say is when you think about chess, since you since you're not you're not just starting out, is that the bishops are a little bit better than the knights. So, so for example, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna give up this bishop for a knight here, long term the bishops are gonna be easier to use because they have more um, they they have, they have more lines kind of they they have more more targets than than knights have. Yeah, that's true. So, so like it, it, when you play the Spanish, this this light square bishop is one of the most important pieces. So, like for example, let's say you move the bishop here and black moves the bishop here. This is this it's fine to trade it because it's a bishop for a bishop. But the problem is, is that black can also move the knight here, and then you're going to have to waste another move to, to bring your bishop back, because you don't want to give up this yeah. bishop for this knight. So so just for continuity, when your opponent plays this this move, you always want to go back to this square. I always back to c2. Right, and so so let, let's say we keep going. Black will probably play something like rook here. Um, now, you can push this pawn, but what I would recommend before pushing this pawn is actually bringing the knight to the center of the board here. Hmm. Why? Why is that? Um. Because if you push this pawn right away, black can actually move the bishop here. Ah, and, yeah. And so, like, if, if you were to push this pawn, um, well, I assume you know about the structure. This is not very good yeah. generally. Like, you, 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 no, no, no. What you want is you always want like this structure, like one, two, three, like this. You never want your pawns ruined where you have to take with your pawn. 
Uh, because if you take with the queen, you actually lose this pawn. Because now you remove the queen yeah. which is defending. Yeah, that's true. So that is very important, yeah. So instead of pushing the pawn, how you want to start is you want to bring the knight here. Because now, if your opponent brings a bishop here, you don't you don't push the pawn right away. Because obviously, if you push the pawn, um, what would happen here? What would black play? He would take a knight. Correct. Yes, and 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 now this this pin of the bishop to the queen is very strong. Yeah. Um, so what you would do is now you can attack the bishop. And so if black. Uh, what, if, mm -hmm. what if it goes back to which is, uh, h5? Which is what he will do. Yeah. Because if you take with the yeah. take bishop, you take with the knight. And now you're going to push the pawn. Because the whole point yeah. is to play in the center, and your bishop guards, and your rook guards, and your knight is very useful on f3 for attacking the pawn on the dark square of e5. So he will go back. And now this is a plan that, that you'll see almost universally when you play the Spanish opening, which is that you move this knight back here. So it looks like yeah, a I've weird seen, move. Yeah, I've seen that before, but I didn't really know the strength of it. But. So, okay, so I'm just going to play a, a random move. So, so I move this knight back. So one of the things with knights is that they don't have the same range as the bishops do, uh, but they you can maneuver them so they can go to better squares here. So in this position, this pin of the knight and the queen is very, very annoying. Like you really want to push this pawn in the center because you're, you're all prepared to push it. But you can't, you still, if you push the pawn, I can take the knight. And and then you yeah. still can't take with the queen. So one one thing that's important is learning how to break these pins. So. So breaking this pin of this bishop towards the knight, there, there's a good move that you can play with, with yeah, your knight. Yeah, knight d3, right? Yes, exactly. So now the knight attacks the bishop. And if the bishop just stays here, you're going <laughs> to capture it. And if it goes back, now what's your next move? Right, now I push d4, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So and that's the pin that's is what gone. you want. Yeah. So you push the pawn. And um, what you're looking for longer term is probably to develop this bishop and then move the queen and the rook into the center of the board. Mm, yeah, that, that makes sense. So it, it's what about the, like my G three knight to? Uh, you don't, to you don't, you, you just don't touch it. You you leave these knights oh. where they, they are because like right now you're like one thing that's very important to know mm -hmm. is like this this box of these four squares these, these E four D four D five E five squares they're generally the most important squares um, on the chessboard. So right right here you've got this really nice center, but your knights are really important because they're guarding the pawn. So what you want to do is you yeah. want to bring bring this bishop, this rook, and the queen in the game. So I'm just going to play a couple of random moves so you see it. Um, but what you'd like to do is something like this, queen here, and then bring the rook. And get everything in the center, and then you're going to look to open it up um, on this D-line. Mm, yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I've been missing, is like the middle game plan. Because like I know how to develop my pieces, but I, like, I didn't know that I needed... To make everything about a center here to uh to actually mm -hmm. just control it completely and being able to break whenever i want to right and another thing i will add just one, one other thing is when you look at the center like i just push this pawn to stop the bishop move you can still move the bishop to the center because your knight and bishop guard the pawn so like you're oh, still yeah. gonna play the same idea by bringing the queen and the rook to the center and looking to open up this this d file but if, if you were to like move, if you were to move one of the knights, your center becomes very weak suddenly because everything is also kind of under attack potentially. So you really need to keep these yeah. knights where they are um, to defend your center. Yeah, that makes sense. So so more or less, um, and now, now I'll get back to the game because it's pretty similar. You did this, you did this. Um, this is all correct. And and again, just for continuity, where would you put the bishop? Because in this in the game, you put the C2. bishop on b three. Yeah, so just put the bishop yeah. on c two. Um, in general so you went back here which okay it's it's slightly different but so let me make some moves and you make the correct moves for white here for white then i would go castle mm -hmm. and then good. uh he won good very good i'm just gonna play some normal moves and a knight good. here so i'm gonna bring my rook well, here uh, he still hasn't put his bishop on there should i prevent that well, oh, bishop, well is, um, no. what I would say is I put my bishop on this other diagonal in this case. Um, so you, I, what I would say in general when you think about the pawns like this is this is completely fine because you always want to create a square for the king, but also long term, it's just uh. a useful move. So you can play it or not, um, but what I would say is you can also just play knight here. And you do All the right. same thing by pushing the pawn up next move. Yeah, and now I create tension in the middle that he 
has a hard time defending. Right. So so basically the point is that the idea is always the same. You're looking to go the one two the the one two through at the night bring the rook over and try to push your pawn and get this big center where you have these two pawns that control the critical squares. Yeah. So so that, that that's what you're trying to um trying to do specifically with this opening. Is get the piece get 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 this pawn push in the center, but make sure there, there are no ideas like bishop g4 or something where black can win material in the center of the board. So you play here, uh scissors play d5, which is fine. And now you capture the pawn. Now this is another thing that I would say is regardless of your bishop, even if the bishop goes back here and your opponent plays here, you're not looking to capture the pawn. No. So yeah, I think it's the nerfs that got the best of me because I normally don't take on that. Especially when he has two other defenders. Right, so the only time it would make sense to make this capture is, for example, let's say you castle, I go bishop here. Something like in this position, for example, uh, if I make a move like this, you can capture and you can win this pawn on the e5 square. Yeah. So something like this um, would be would be good, but in general, you're really not likely to get this opportunity. So unless you have this... this, this, this uh, situation where you can win this pawn here um on e5 then you're you're not really looking to capture this pawn because what happens is theoretically let's say you take the pawn i take and you castle um black can put a lot of pressure because now you have this weak pawn here on this d3 square mm, yeah so like i could go knight f4 and i'm gonna win the pawn you have no good way to uh to protect the protect the pawn on d3 oh, that's yeah i can't I can't actually defend it twice in time. Right. So like when, when you put when you put the pawns on these two squares, the pawn is very good because it supports the pawn in front of it. But if you take the pawn, then then it becomes a big weakness because of this move or even a move like this as well. And what happens mm, is this pawn no. becomes a huge target. So so that's why in general when you play the Spanish, you aren't really looking to do that. So you play d4, which unfortunately blunders this pawn um, on e4. Takes. And now, now here, black can can play knight g4 and, and recapture, but it didn't happen. So we'll just keep going with the game. Um, all pretty normal. By the way, you should you should have taken this knight first because when you when you took the queen, there was an opportunity for black to play the in between move with knight takes queen, oh. which is check. But where, yeah, that's where, true. Where would you go here? Because uh, your king. I guess I would go if. Yeah, I'll go f1, right? Right. So, so king f1, and then when I take the queen, you just take the knight. Yeah. And you're up. You're you're still ahead. But it's just important to note that, like in, in these sorts of positions, <clears throat> just just think of. I, I think also think about the pieces that are kind of near your king here. Like you you knew. I remember when I was when I was doing the commentary. You knew this was a blunder. But like when pieces yeah. when they're only like one or two pieces near your king, always be a, always look and see where they can move and where they can attack your king, or where the yeah. checks are. Yeah, de definitely. That that could have won some material back and also like confused me a lot. Right. So, okay. This, I mean, this middle game got kind of away from me. One thing I would add though is when, uh, when you got to this position, um, where you were up the bishop. One one thing you should remember is that a bishop and objectively a bishop like a bishop and a knight are worth more than one rook. Um, yeah. Because like when you when when you take this bishop here, um, and black takes back with the rook and you move the bishop. Let's just say this position. The bishop and knight are better than the rook because this is the only open line for for the rooks potentially but your bishops actually cover all the squares this bishop covers these two and this bishop covers this square so even if black gets the rooks doubled here like let me just make a random move there's actually no entry on any any of these squares so even though it looks really pretty you can kind of remaneuver your knight and your bishops to better squares yeah i i i completely missed just taking with rook as well and i think i ended up taking with bishop and it was not a good idea. Yeah, so I mean that that's the only thing is because you were ahead by one 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 bishop here, you should have given up your rook for for this bishop yeah. instead of giving back the bishop. Because the funny thing is, even though the material here you're ahead by one pawn, black is black is probably maybe even uh probably not better, but black is completely fine because the two bishops have a lot more range. Um than than your bishop and your knight do here. Yeah, I, that's that's for sure, yeah. So you traded, you played h4. Um, what I would say, like in this position, one thing as well, um, and this is more a general concept, is when you have the opportunity, um, 
you can put your pawns in, in in a formation kind of like this because when you have pawns supporting each other like this the only the only way your opponent can win these pawns or the only way they become a target is if you can get get behind get get behind yeah. and attack the base so like which pawn here is the base of of these pawns that does be two right so the only way the only way to to um to win here or not win here but to gain material would be to win this pawn but black can't get there because with the bishop you would need like you would need to go here here and capture or you need, need yeah. to get the rook down and capture but it's not realistic so when you're thinking about like these pawns that are under attack um you, sh you should be aware that when you can create these sorts of pawn structures if, if the pawns are supporting each other all three are together um the only weakness is at the base so if you can't hit the base then um then it's completely fine so um so oh, yeah, I, I blundered a lot in that game. I think the nerves got to me a lot. Right. So, 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 so that that that's what I would say. Um, uh, in in general, is that is 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 just like try try to think about these general concepts because like the, you're not always going to uh. have these opportunities, but I do think you can internalize and um and remember them. Yeah, I think the the only thing was that I was playing a little bit too fast again. Mm -hmm. uh, this time around, and I tried to like he was very low on the clock, but of course with five second increment it wasn't that big of a deal because we ended up uh, trading a lot of material, and then he could easily get time back. Right, right. So, but but it's not it's not a big deal. It's just something general to try to remember. Yeah. It's a it's a general concept that like and like another example would be like um like even this and this is a much more basic example let me say you play the pawn here if you look at these two pawns they support each other or, or let me give an even better example i'm just making random moves just so you can conceptualize it like let's say you get this sort of position for example with four pawns in a row like a pawn chain like this um yeah. again the only pawn that you can really attack here is this one on each two because if you win this one then the rest of the pawns kind of fall in a row generally yeah for sure so so that that's the one thing it's just like here when you have these pawns like just to think about sort of these potential structures of the pawns together um so yeah so rook d8 rook d8 h4 um and now bishop a2 okay all pretty normal um just gonna go through this pretty quickly to get to the critical point right so at this point you you actually got this really good position here now now when you look at this position um you see you see how these pawns are all in dark squares more or less yeah not even the pawns actually everything except for one pawn is on a dark square which means that um the light square bishop can't attack anything and yeah, that, that was the plan since he had a light square bishop and i didn't and i had the knight right so so now this this is like more general but but one thing that's important when you have like and, and this is just a general thing like when you ha when you have pawns and you're trying to push pawns forward normally you don't you want to keep the pawns connected as much as you can because when you play this pawn yeah. after the capture you see how this pawn becomes weak like yeah, you both have true. one piece guarding it but it becomes weak um so what you really would like to do is take more space and use the pawns um so so like at this point the pawn supports the pawn in e5 very nicely but if you really want to push this pawn what you should play for is push this one forward Mm, yeah of course so i'm just gonna make some yeah. random moves again so the difference here is that you see these pawns restrict the king the king can't come forward to any of these squares does that make some sense yeah it, it does make sense yeah so so that that's one thing again like i'm not going to go over this end game in terms of how to win it because it's very very advanced but what you want to do is if you're trying to push your opponent back here you really in most middle games or end games that are very late where you don't have queens and rooks you don't really need to worry about the king safety like here you're pushing the pawns in front of your king um but secondly it's like the way that you win a lot of end games is you use pawn chains like these, these pawns kind of together or you, you use like two pawns like like this for example where the pawns just start marching up the board in tandem you really want to have a couple yeah. of pawns together you don't you don't like a situation where the pawns end up being split because in the game, once this occurs, you see, like, think about this position. Now, if you had a pawn on this square, you would be doing fine here. Yeah, then it would be a nice fork coming up. Yes, yeah, so that, but also, like, conceptually, it, your, your opponent's not oh, trying yeah. to capture. Because you just recaptured yeah. your pawn. So, like, that's why when, when you go back here, let me give you an example. Let's just say I play my pawn. Well, I, if I do this, it's a blunder. Why is this a blunder? 
Uh, for black or for white, sorry? For black. Well, the move I just played is a big mistake. Uh, because I take the check and then your rook is hanging? Right, so I can't recapture the pawn. Exactly. So yeah. I'm just going to move my rook here. And let's say we get to this position. And now I try to push the pawn. So do you, do you know mm -hmm. uh, what a protected pass pawn is? I, you probably know what a pass pawn is anyway. Um, yeah, 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 a pass pawn. A protected, I guess it has a buddy. So, okay, so, so yeah, exactly. So, so here, for example, which of these two moves looks better to you? Pushing or capturing? Uh, I'll say pushing because then, like, it's only two squares away from uh, promoting and it's protected by everything, basically. Right, so, like, let's say you take the pawn. The problem is that now my king is active and I'm actually attacking this pawn long term, potentially. Yeah. So, this is where the concept of, like, a protected pass pawn is important because your knight and your pawn both guard it. So even though your opponent can try to blockade it, this pawn is always threatening to go up the board. And now black black is much, much worse. So like th this whole idea of trying to push ahead was very, very good um, in the game. It's just that in order to do that, you want to use like these pawns together. You don't. It's really hard when you only have one pawn to sort of push it forward, take more space, or even make a queen. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, so that's why yeah. like... You'll probably see this again where you have some some positional structure where you have pawns like this. Um, and if it's if queens aren't on the board, you're always looking to push and try to try to use the two two pawns or three pawns together. Yeah, it, it makes sense because I don't know. I felt like I was a little worried about like leaving my king exposed, but I guess that's no way for his rook or anything to get to. Uh, right, and and, and that that's background. actually that's actually that's that's good that you're thinking like that because. In, a, in any other situation, like let's say there were more pieces on the board, that would be very accurate. You don't want to um, you don't want to push the pawns in front of in, in front of your king. So, um, but in this situation, when you just think about it, just try to think about your opponent's position. Your opponent has no way of like using the rook. Like rooks are very powerful when you have open files, you have open lines, right? But black yeah, rook has basically nothing. Close now. Yeah, in, in fact, like. The problem for black is like even though you have this pawn, which maybe would be a weakness normally, it's very good because the rook guards it, and then the pawn supports both the pawn on b4 and the knight at the same time. So because there are no open, um, there are no open open lines for the rook, you, you can actually start pushing the pawns in this end game. So it, it's yeah. very important, um, like I when you reach the structure, try to make these pawns and use them together. Yeah, I like make the line and uh, I just get a. Uh pass pawn somehow when he yeah. starts uh, trying to fight back right so like uh, i mean i'm not gonna i'll just give you an example don't this is not something you're gonna, gonna remember it's, it's it's way too advanced but but like i'll just just so maybe you can get something out of these couple of moves that i'm playing so like the way that you would try to win this game for example is white is um is to push this pawn go here and play something like this what's the idea mm. To go g7 and then win the right. pawn. Well, the bishop guards it, but yes, the idea is to oh, bring, yeah. bring, but the idea is to bring the rook in. So now I'm going to play my rook here. Let's trade, and um, and now I'm going to show you a neat thing. I mean, again, this is not something you'll remember, but this is just this is just so you, you can you can like visually maybe you can you can implement it in some way. But when you reach some end game or an, or an end game where there there are very few pieces, like only rooks or only bishops or knights, um, one thing that's important is to think of the king as an attacking piece. Because now you need yeah. to use your king to attack when there's so few other forces on the board. Um, so black would like to bring his king in. So the move here that you can play is knight here. Yeah, I saw that. And if he decides right. to try to protect the pawn, you can... Uh... Now here there's, go... there's a brilliant move. I... I'm looking at the e uh, 97. It's a good move. But... Okay, so so this that's a that's actually the best move. But why did I say it's a brilliant move? This is where I want to see if you understand the point of this move. Because his king is stuck now. His, yes. So when you think about this conceptually, first of all, everything is on dark squares, right? So the bishop can't yeah. attack anything. Secondly, the king is stuck for the whole game. His king can never come in because you can't remove the knight because uh. it covers these squares. And so when you move the king, even if he tries this, the king still can't come in. So you see the pawns actually pawns in the knight prevent the king from ever coming in for the rest of the game. Yeah, and then I can go to uh Yeah, you just go one, two, the, uh, three, four, five, six, come over and make a queen and you'll win the game. 
So you can just literally yeah. move the king and there's nothing your opponent can do because the pawns restrict the squares and your knight stops the king from ever coming into the game. That's a really cool concept, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's probably not something that will happen, but just on the off chance you have a situation where you reach an end game, just to be mindful of that. Because normally we think think of bishops as being better than knights. But but when you have um, when you have limited material and everything can potentially be on the opposite color of what the bishop is, the knight can be a lot better. There's something also I heard, like, if you're against an opposite color bishop, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this has been more material, but it's good to place, like, your pawn chains on, like, let's say they have light square bishop and you don't, then it's good to place your uh, pawns on the light squares, like, and make a pawn chain there, because uh, oh, yes. it disallows a lot of moves from the from the bishop, right? Yes, we're, we're getting to that in the next game. Ah, that's, okay. that's literally <laughs> the next game that you played against scissors. So, um, let, let me just see, was there anything else that I wanted to point out? I was looking Not for, really. like, some kind of mate in, the, in this one when he, his king moved in. Right, Like, right. some kind of prep, mm -hmm. but that was nothing. Yeah, I think it was already very hard to play. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think both of you could have improved, but it's already at the point where there's nothing specific or standard. So, let me pull up the next game, because th this actually, what you just said about opposite, opposite color bishops, is exactly um, what I wanted to point out from this next game that you played. Oh. So, <laughs> right, so let me um, I'll close this one. Let me invite you to this board. Okay. And by the way, to be clear, most of the stuff you did in that game was very good overall. It was it was very, very well done. Okay, so now let me, let me flip the board. Okay, so you were black in this game, right? Yes. Okay, so your opponent played this is what we call the Vienna game, moving this knight out instead of moving this knight out. Um, now one yeah, I was a little. Yeah. One thing that I'm gonna say is like, um, if your opponent, not even your opponent moves this knight. Well, yeah, let's just say, let's say your opponent moves a knight out here. I would recommend that you play knight here. And if your opponent okay. plays bishop here, just to just to kind of mirror at least at the start and bring your bishop out. With the mm. same ideas of developing your knight and castling your king. Yeah. So when your opponent plays this knight move, um, I would I would recommend that you mirror with this knight out to c6 here. Okay. So that, you played knight f6. It, it just seems Ill, it just seems illogical to me to like go and protect a piece that's not going to be attacked until okay. next move. Well, I mean, yeah. did you look at this knight f6 move or not? Did, are you familiar uh, with this, or you were just playing? I was just playing knight f6 to attack his pawn. Uh, okay, that, you know I know it's protected, but then I could push my d pawn, right? Okay, scrap what I said. Just just play knight f6 on move two. Just just play this knight out, and now if your opponent plays knight here, now you will develop and protect the pawn. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing. You're probably going to move the bishop to one of these two squares, castle your king, and then push the pawn and bring this bishop out. Exactly. Okay. So, all right, so so Scissors played a3, and now here you played a move that's that... That's so weird. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not I'll, t I'll tell you what he did, because one thing is like when you're showing openings to players, they're trying to conceptualize the, the plan. So so what he was probably uh. shown was something like this, and pawn here. Mm. And the uh. idea is that if you try to attack the bishop, I can keep the bishop on the line down towards this pawn in f7. Oh, yeah, okay, that's that's a nice little trick. Yeah, if I try to chase off the bishop or anything. So I think that's what he was shown, but then during the game, he probably, he just, he confused the order, so he pushed the pawn ah. first to a3. And now here you played pawn b6. Now, one thing that I would say is if you, when you have these structures with the pawns, the e4 and e5, um, almost always you want to develop the bishop on this diagonal towards the pawn on h3. Mm. Um, so it's going to require pushing this pawn instead of pushing this pawn. Yeah. I, I thought it would be in case to get another attacker on the e4, but uh, yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's possible to do that, but in general, I, I would say that if, if you if if you with this light square bishop in these e4 e5 openings, um, you always look to develop it on this diagonal. Ah, okay. So so just keep that in mind in in mind for for future matches. Um, but what I would also add is when your opponent plays a3, you could have you could have tried to strike at the center right away and push this pawn as well. Yeah, but it, it threw me a little bit off because I've yeah. not really seen that before, so I didn't know mm -hmm. I, what to do. So I just did a, like a waiting move myself, I guess. Yeah, and it's but, it's completely uh, fine. I mean, obviously you're nervous. Yeah, and if you're not sure what your opponent's no. doing, you're you're just trying to to find something. So it's completely fine. Um, it's it, it's all good.
Okay, so b3, bishop c5, completely fine, by the way, all pretty normal, um, completely fine, trade. Right, and so so, so th this is kind of, it's, it all ties in together. So so remember what I said in the first, first situation, how you try to put the bishop back on c2 instead of b3? Yeah. It's the exact same thing here that this bishop in these these openings with e4, e5, where white puts a bishop and tries to put it on this diagonal, black almost always is trying to get rid of that light square bishop. So it's a different kind of like situation with the placement of the pieces, but it's still all about this bishop on this diagonal. But here it's on c4, uh. whereas in, in, in the Spanish, it ends up on a4, and then it has to decide which square to go to between b3 and c2. Yeah. But it's but it's it's all the same. So I like knight a5. It's a, it's a it's a very nice move trying to get rid of the bishop on the diagonal and opening up towards the knight on b5 as well. It's a trade. He took. Okay, here you could have taken this pawn, but it, it occurs anyway. So you take b4. Um, now one thing I, I would say here is like in this position you have two bishops, which is very nice. But you're you're ahead by one pawn here. Yeah. So so what what you want what you would like to do um is you can actually trade down. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty good trade, right? It's a very good trade for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have one extra pawn, but then secondly, white's pawn structure is very compromised. I have two sets of these double yeah. pawns. So yeah. not only are you ahead by one pawn, but white has two sets of double pawns, which is really really bad. Yeah, I can definitely see that. That, that I was thinking of that, but I felt like I wanted to keep the attack. Uh, but his I, against his king, since mm. I have my queen on the uh, file, and like my bishop staring down on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think both both moves are completely fine. To be clear, it's just that I think when you're ahead and, and your opponent kind of has these bad pawns, you should be aware of his pawns and what the potentials are for for end games that can that, that can happen. Yeah, yeah, because like against opponents are. Uh, equal skill like i'm not gonna be able to like win two or three pieces in uh in the first right. Part of the game right it's gonna come down to the, probably the end, end end game um so yeah so yeah you played this which is fine bishop b2 you played c5 excellent move by the way so so this is this now turns there there are a couple things that i that i, that I want to say about this this situation so what you'll see here is you have what are called opposite color bishops um so so when you have opposite color bishops the traditional rules are if you get rid of like the queens and the rooks, it's probably going to be a draw. But when you have mm. um, when you when you have when when you have like queens and rooks on the board, normally the side that can try to whoever's king is more open, it can be much more vulnerable because there's nothing to sort of interpose this bishop. Like your bishop on e4 is really really strong. Yeah. So 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 that, that that's what I would say um, is that that's a general rule. To keep in mind when you reach the sort of position so you went here completely fine completely fine right so now now we now we transition to the end game and this is this is where what i want again it comes back did i this so time did i miss an attack on uh, on his king uh, yeah i mean probably before is mm -hmm. if now this if i play like queen uh, g6 or something wouldn't that have been interesting yeah. or would he just been, like i i saw it in the game but I, I didn't think I had the time to like he could just play uh, G3 right and then yeah no this this actually would have been um the best move because you're, you're you create a double attack hmm oh yeah jeez I didn't even see that so so yeah so like you're, you're right that white can stop the checkmate with any number of moves but then you win this pawn on C2 because you're the two pieces that attack it yeah I I, I completely missed that yeah so it, because it I did fine. see I did see the g6, but I, I just saw it as a mate friend, and I thought, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do much, and he can maybe double up to uh, to hit my bishop, and then I have to retreat anyway. Right, right. So 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 yeah, it, it's fine though. It doesn't matter. Um, but that wasn't really what I was the point I was gonna make. So so now mm. I want you to think about this position. Like you see how you have this pawn chain, right? Yeah. And remember, I said something about attacking. Like, the, the thing is, White would like to attack if he wins this one, then the whole thing's going to collapse, right? Yeah. But in this case, it's a little bit different because you can have a situation where White can trade the pawns. And so now, this is technically the base, but is there another point that you could maybe try to attack with the White Bishop to win all the pawns? Where, where would White like the, Which pawns would White like to attack with the Bishop to win? 
I, I would or like not to win, sorry, win, the... win, 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 win all the pawns. I guess uh, the the C two pawn would. Uh... Well, well, I said white. We'll get we'll get to black. Oh, but I'm, nice I'm asking card. for white right now. All right, then there would be C five, right? To uh, yeah, to, exactly. Uh, get the mm -hmm. middle pawn out of the way as well. Right. So how would white try to attack that pawn on C five? Is there a way? What, like you need to use the bishop, right? So can you yeah, maybe? I guess you would push uh, push the A pawn. Very good. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like white would push the A pawn and go bishop here and then then win this pawn on C5. And um, yeah. I mean, at this point, the game would probably be a draw because black has no way to sort of protect all these pawns. Oh, that's true. Yeah, because I just go here and capture like that. That's the thing. So like when, when, I, when I go back after this move, like it doesn't matter about the move specifically, but can white attack? You see, white white can only attack at the base now because all the pawns are safe. You see, they, they just support each other one no. after the other. So the only way to win the pawns now is if you could somehow get something around to this one and then win all the pawns in a row. Yeah, what if he played it, like pushed up the A pawn and... Well, yeah, I well, guess, yeah, I'll just take... Mm -hmm. Yeah, i just let him take and then... Uh, well, this is a, th this was actually the game, so so he oh. did play B5. <laughs> he, for, he did not take. But the point was that, oh. like, regardless of colors, just to think about it when you have opposite color bishops, and you sort of have these these pawn chains, like where can you attack in the chain or not attack it? Yeah. Um. So he goes here. You played this move. Very very good move, by the way, attacking this pawn. So now so now, it's not really a chain, but you see how white has these two pawns here. Yeah. How how would you which which how would you try to where would you which, which pawn would you like to attack with with a piece? Like the DC DC four pawn, of course. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so that's what you'd like to do. So C three is played in the game, um, and now here you capture it. But one thing that's important as well to remember, this is just about bishops, is right now this bishop is very passive, right? Because it's behind these pawns and it, yeah. it has no like it's technically on this diagonal, but the diagonal is closed. Yeah. So taking was not the. Right, so taking That's is a very good. bad move, because now I actually, I, if you move the bishop, for example, I can try to bring my bishop in, and my bishop becomes very active as white. Yeah. So, so what yes. you should have done here after c3 is ignore it. You should have pushed the pawn. Oh, yeah, then he can't move it at all. Then it's stuck there, yeah. Right. Locking off his own bishop. So now I'm going to move my bishop, and again, how would you... Um, how would you try to, I mean, not win the game, but but win a lot of material? How would you try to win, win some pieces here? I, I... So you want to attack this pawn, right? You, you the, if the if the if the base, which is this pawn of the pawn chain, yeah. um, falls, then you're gonna win the game. Yeah, uh, I was also thinking of like protecting my pass pawn, uh, but if I move my e8 rook to d8, then my bishop falls, right? Right, and that's not that's not a bad that's not a bad concept. In, in this situation, it doesn't work because you lose the bishop, but I do like uh, it anyway. Um, but but there but because it's an end game again, this is the thing that's important. Uh, Since it's an end game, it's a little bit different. Like you kind of have time to maneuver and put your pieces on better squares. Oh, so, so I if I push my uh, my d pawn, and then then I can get my uh, bishop on uh, on d three and start. Uh, eating his pawns, right? Right, but you, you did, let, let's say you don't want to give up this pawn here. Yeah. Is there another way of where you can put the bishop where you're going to attack um, where you can attack the c4 pawn? Not currently, so I'd have to do like uh, f5 to uh, e6, I guess. Perfect. That, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um. Mm. Is, so like when you reach end games, it's more about like thinking about an idea of a couple moves rather than like a one move <laughs> tactic or like a solution on the spot. Um, there's also, a, actually since my chat just told me, there's a very neat tactic, which I'll show you as well, which is this move. So it looks like a bad takes... move, right? Yeah, but I win the rook if you take. Right. I guess. So I'm going to take your rook. Then I take... Okay, now I'm gonna take your bishop. And now? Oh. Now I can play uh, E1. 
and then push. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you got it. Yeah, like just because yeah. my chat chat pointed that out, I thought I'd show you. But yeah, you actually you're you're gonna win material here, probably the game. Yeah. Um, because yeah, if he the... takes, I win rook. Right. Yeah. So okay, but this, this is like a fancy tactic. But the but the, but the general point I was gonna make is yeah, you can bring the bishop and it always attacks this pawn. And then once you win this pawn, the uh, the pawn here will fall. Or for example, um, I'm just gonna make some random moves. Doesn't really matter. Um, let's say we get to this position. Um, the other thing you can do with 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 having bishops opposite colors is you can you can guard certain squares as well. So like you can play yeah. like bishop b3. Oh yeah. And, then, uh... and you cover this square. So what you want to do is you want to push the pawn up the board and make a queen. Yeah. That and you can also, secondarily, another point. So you can also make this a protected pass pawn. Oh, yeah. And it, it's quite similar to the previous game we looked at as well, where it's like you create the supported pass pawn. And even, even if you're not yeah. going to make a queen right away, it just it, the pawn just lingers there. Um, it just lingers there and your opponent always has to be worried about it. Yeah, it's always going to be a threat and he's going to be having a hard time getting to my pawns without, like, having right. to fret of uh, me promoting. Right, because it's like your, your pawn on C4, like, it ties the bishop and the pawn. Like, your opponent can't attack anything here. And this is why opposite color bishop positions are very hard, because when you look at this position, your opponent can't attack anything. The, just the two pawns and the bishop, they all support each other perfectly. Like, if your opponent had a light square bishop, he could attack the pawns. But with a dark square bishop, there's no. no way to attack. Yeah, and as soon as he's moved his rook, his A pawn falls, and yeah. Right, so like, hypothetically, let's just say your opponent pushes this pawn to, to try and uh, create something. You could just move your rook up here. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a cool and move. you attack this one, and after I capture, let's say I capture, how would you finish the game here? I'd probably uh, take the check, mm -hmm. uh, and then I would uh, push pawn. Yeah, can defend perfect. without losing the uh, the rook. And, and then uh, your bishop guards the square. So I, when I move the rook, yeah. you make a queen, and you win the rook, and you win the game. It's perfect. Yeah. So like. Yeah, this is the thing is like what I'm showing. It's not like it's not move specific. It's just these little ideas because I think um, especially since you're almost I think you're guaranteed to be in the that next stage. The games are not going to have these sorts of big blunders. So these sort of these small concepts and ideas in this middle game and end game are going to be much more important. Yeah, that's definitely also where I feel like I lag a bit is simply like the mid um, into middle game where like I haven't played it enough. So far, I, I can see some tactics, but like knowing how to push the pawn chain correctly and stuff mm -hmm. like that is definitely something that's gonna benefit a lot. Yeah, I, I think especially like the like this. Um, let me let me show. Yeah, this um, this, this like this protected pass pawn, even without the bishop, is very important, especially in, in these middle games or end games when you can get a pass pawn that's supported by another pawn. Um, it's really really strong. It, it's just in general, it's almost always gonna be very good. The one thing I would add though on the flip side is that when you have um, like a protected pass pawn or even even just a pass pawn, the best piece to defend here is not a bishop. Like you see how this bishop, it's, it's not really doing a whole lot. If white had a knight that he could put in front of the pawn, um, the knights are the best defenders for pa against pass pawns. Oh yeah, they can just sit there, yeah. Right, so so that's just a general thing as well to remember. So, all right, let's, um, let's see. So I did not actually look at these games from yesterday, so. We're gonna. I'm. This is gonna be my first look at at your games against oh. Forreston. All right. So let's see. E4, E5. Or let me invite you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just, just, just go off on randomly. Okay. So knight f3. Okay. So so Forreston played this Petrov defense. Um. And you played yeah. e3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure what the best thing would be there, but yeah. I just played d d3 just because it's. It's I uh, moved that uh, protects right away, but the so, only thing I was worried about is my bishop and uh, my light squared bishop. It's right. like that's not gonna get much scope. Right. So, so what I would say um, is, is generally it went, when when one side does this, where they close this diagonal down very early in the game like this, that means they end up they end up fiancheting shadowing the bishop with this bishop here, mm. because then, then long term you have more scope. Um, yeah. 
But but yeah, what what I what I would recommend though is since you like to play the Spanish, bring this knight out and protect the pawn. So All right. when your opponent, let's say they bring the knight out to guard the pawn, you you have four knights out, is now just move the bishop here anyway. Ah, yeah, of course. And, and yeah, and, and so basically just play similar kind of idea, push this pawn to open up the bishop, but castle and, and bring the rook to the center again. But what if he starts pushing my bishop back now with the a6? Well, if he does then this... Then I gotta be careful. Um, I think here is actually... Is this a blunder? Let me think for a second. One... Yeah, I think you, you can still go back. And now let's say I push you back, you go back here. And let's yeah. say, and, and if black tries to win the bishop with the knight move because you have you have no uh, no retreats, you can actually just take this pawn and you're up a pawn. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I was just like when I have my knight on uh, c3, I feel like I can't really do the Spanish that well without worrying about mm -hmm. trapping my bishop. Very true, very true. So now, so so yeah, you you have this knight here. So I'm just gonna push my pawn to support the pawn with this idea. So now again, yeah. you you really don't want to give me this idea to win your bishop. No, then I'll probably just play a3. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, that's just, that's perfect. That's that's exactly what I wanted to hear because basically, again, whenever your opponent attacks the bishop, you just drop that. So so the main thing in in all these setups with bringing this bishop out is that you never really want to give your opponent the opportunity to capture the bishop with his knight. So um, no. So yeah, that's, that's just that's just fantastic. Very, very good. Okay, so anyway, you played d3, knight c6, bishop b3, completely fine, by the way. Check, good, okay, decent. So yeah, so so once again, what I would say here is when you, when you have these pawns in the center like this, you always need to be mindful that this pawn on d3 protects this pawn on e4. So, so like yeah. you always, you, you have the right idea in mind, you always wanna push the pawn to, to the center because you want these two pawns. But you need to be mindful um, of this pawn being under attack on this e4 square and being captured. Yeah, that's true. I I, I miss that every time. Uh, that's, it's it's, uh, it's I fine. Just, like, do, do I just play knight uh, uh, knight e2 again to yeah. protect it? Yeah, yeah like because uh, I have to push him. You're you you're, you're probably out of everyone that I've coached. You're you're the person who, who's picking this up the fastest by far. <laughs> like I just oh, that's good. <laughs> well well yeah because what I'm saying is like you're like the especially this a three thing like a, a lot of a lot of the other people that I've seen what they would do is they would they would panic because it's not the exact same position. But like you're you're understanding oh. that it's like this bishop is so important and and you just you don't want to give it up. So this is this is very very good. Um, you're picking this up really really fast. So okay, Thank you played you. <laughs> d4. Takes castles. Right, you played e5, completely fine. This should be four. Right now here, um the one thing that, that's worth noting is that there's a lack of your development. Like your king's not getting out of the center very quickly. No, that's so true. so when when you push your pawns, and this is one thing that's very important, is when you push pawns in the center, you need to be aware of that, that your king isn't getting stuck. Um, that it's not gonna be trapped here because it, it in a stronger but in a game between stronger players this would be very very bad for white because your opponent would be able to ta attack your central pawns immediately before you have time to move your bishop and get your king out of the center oh yeah so knight c3 knight e4 now the best move for black here would actually not be knight e4 it'd be knight to d5 because i'm attacking yeah, both the knight and the bishop oh yeah that's that's grim uh but it, anyway, it, it doesn't really matter because this won't happen again. Uh. It's just to just to keep it in mind. Uh. Um, and the other thing I would also add in general is is as well, if you get your pawns to the center like this, where your opponent does not have any pawns here, and you have the option to push forward, um, most of the time you don't want to do that. Most of the time you just want to bring mm. bring your knight here and bring your bishop here. You don't want to commit to pushing one of these central pawns forward in, until you want to. You just you, you oh, don't okay. really want to do that because like. The, the general thing here is that like let's just when you have pawns in the center you have you, this is what you'd say we have you have more space because your pawns yeah. are, are, are can push his pieces back potentially and so normally your opponent has to try to strike back in the center of the move like d5 to try to get rid of these pawns um get get rid of your center pawns yeah because right now your opponent mm-hmm 
like after he plays uh, d5, would I push then or would you I? Would. Uh, yes. Okay. Now the reason you would okay. push, um, so so let's get back to the game. So let, let me say I just play knight here. The, the reason that you don't mind pushing there is because the pawn structure is much different where the black pawns are. So let's say you play queen here. The problem is now your opponent can push this pawn. Mm, yeah. And attack your center immediately. Or maybe push this one. I mean, in this, this situation is not a good move, but there are opportunities to attack the pawn. So if we rewind and we go back to this spot and you play knight here, You'll notice that when you reach this position, there's no opportunity to push the pawn. The pawn is already up, so there's no way to attack these, this pawn chain on d4, d4 and e5. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense, yeah. So so that's why, yeah, normally um, you if you have these pawns in the center and you're, you just want to make sure that you, you protect them and you wait for your opponent to try to try to attack your pawns in the center with his pawns and capture them um, before committing to one of these plans. Yeah, that makes sense to make him like want to dis uh, disrupt the center and then I can decide which. Right, which because again, you've, you've got you've got more space. So when you have more space, you're in no you're you're in no rush to push forward. Like you can just finish your development here because you haven't moved your bishop or your king. So you've played yeah, the, the only thing was uh, that like I felt like having the pawns protect each other freed up like some of my pieces to do something else. Right. But mm -hmm. I guess he can attack them with pawns as well. And then my center is going to be right so so yeah. actually there, there's a better move than so if you if you really are going to push the pawns here the better move is to push this one because he doesn't have a e pawn anymore well there are two reasons first of all if you push this one the knight can still stay in the center for him and it actually yeah. blockades you see how there are these two pawns it's this is what we call oh. a blockade because you don't have a pawn to kick the knight anymore oh yeah i'm never going to be able to remove the knight without trading pieces correct but if you push this one you see it's still the same kind of pawn 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 chain but you're but you don't give up the square the knight can't stay in the center because your knight covers this square yeah that, that that makes sense yeah and so let's say i move the knight back and you bring the bishop out you'll notice in this case with the pawns black really needs to use his pawns to attack the these pawns in the center but first of all the knight's in the way so i can't attack like this so i can't push this f pawn so the only way to try to attack would be to push this pawn so there's only one opportunity to try and attack the center here hmm Whereas if we go back, when you push like this, just you'll see I have two ways to attack the pawn in the center. Yeah, yeah exactly, and uh, it's gonna fall. I, I, I can't, uh, I can trade it, but then I don't have to center as, as well anymore as I did before. Right. So, so like that, that's a very general thing. It's not, it's not really a big deal. But just be aware that when you have the big center, when you have pawns in the center, try to think if your opponent has pawns that they can, they can threaten to capture your pawn with in the center when you push them forward. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so this was all fine. Yeah, and this was a terrible move by Force, and um, yeah, really bad. And yeah, after this, I don't think there's anything more to be said about this game specifically because you just, as far as I saw it, I think you just played this pretty well. Um, yeah, and, and also you saw this check, by the way. I was going to point this out as well. This check was very uh, nice, winning the bishop on b4. So uh, that, that was a uh, good tactic for once. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think really it helps not having that many nerves going on. That uh, that really allowed me just to look at the board more clearly. Right, and and I mean, yeah, everything you did was was pretty much fine. Also, like, what, what would I do? Like this move was actually very complexing. The uh, pawn to yeah. d four with the fork. Mm -hmm. I was not sure how, if there was any way I could prevent that, other than hoping uh, for a check and him going to a bad square. Yeah, I mean, at this point, since you're up two, two pieces, it's not a big deal. What I probably would recommend, since it fits in with the concept before, is you could have just kept the knight and moved it here. And after pawn mm. takes bishop, you just take the pawn. Because, again, this knight ah. is what's on, what, what we call an outpost. Like, there, there are no pawns. Yeah. I, can't, I can't attack with a pawn. Yes, I can move the bishop and trade it, but there are no pawns to remove it. So this knight is very good here. Generally speaking, as I said before... The, the knights are the best when they can block when they can like get outposts or blockade pawns. Yeah, that makes sense. So I mean, probably I'd play this, but again, I, w anything here is very good. So it's there's nothing really that I can be critical of. I think the only thing mm -hmm. that I would say is be aware that your king is still in the center, and at some point try to castle yeah. the king, this king to this side. Also, that's the other thing is like in this position, I would not recommend castling to the queen side. Because when there are open files down towards your king, generally it's better to have the king 
uh, on the king side. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, he did this. Let me just see. Yeah, see, like, this is what I was going to say is, like, in, in this game, like, here again, I would have just castled the king out of the center of the board. But that's, that's very minor, and it doesn't really, really matter that much, per se. But that's the only thing, it's just, like, to remember that especially when you're ahead in material, when you have extra pieces, just get the king out of the center. Yeah, I, I, I just felt very under attack with his uh, queen and bishop eyeing uh, my king side. Right, so so the thing that I would say also is, like, when, when, when in, in this sort of situation where you've pawns here, normally, the only way if you're, since you don't have a bishop, uh, you don't have this bishop fian fianchettoed here, the only way for black to, um, take advantage here is to line up some kind of battery along this long diagonal so oh. if there's not a battery that can be lined up then generally your king is actually very safe here oh, okay that's good to know because it felt like very scary to castle there uh, yeah no well i mean it's it's good like e even even if even if it's not 100 correct i like the reasoning that you know you thought your king might be open here um, if you castle king side, like it's a, it's a legit reason for for not castling. So, um, so so it makes sense. And, and also the other thing I would say is your opponent can put a bishop here, and you move the rook. Yeah. And once again, the only way to try to make some checkmate is to have something on this diagonal, um, or mm. something that you can come down with the rook and the bishop here. Yeah. But in this case, you can't really do it because, for example, let's just say I try to trade some rooks here. Let's say you trade, you can now go bishop back. Ah. Oh. Yeah, of course. Because you, since you're since you're ahead, you have this extra extra knight here. You're you're fine. And if your opponent doesn't trade, let's say he goes back, you can just put the bishop here. And now, once you create mm. the, put the bishop here in front with the king, your king is always going to be a very safe on g1. Yeah, that makes sense because it's also threatened. Like you can't get to the f1 square, uh, square at all uh, with my bishop there as well. Right. So so in in general terms, like that's the only thing I would say about this one is that you should make sure um that that you do try to uh you do do try to castle your king but overall very very good very good game um ma mainly i think the thing is since you do like these positions with these pawns in the center where you want to get these two pawns just be aware of this pawn on e4 being under attack yeah that that's <laughs> it happens too many times luckily a lot of people miss it though i don't know why but a lot of people don't see it hanging after i guess they're worried about some tricks if they haven't castled yet and such I mean, probably the reason is because they're just not as good as you are. Um, oh, well, yeah, that it, might it, also be one. <laughs> well, but, but but again, well, I think the thing is like this is like like what I was saying earlier about remembering remembering the ideas is like so most of most of us when we coach, what we're doing is we're saying we're, we're like okay, you want to develop your pieces, castle your king. So a lot of people are kind of that that's the only thought in their mind is develop and castle the king, um, and they don't step back and then think about the other options as well. Because if you're if you're newer if you're newer to the game like that's just one of those things it's like your coach has castle you know develop castle your king so that's just the first thought and when they bring when they bring the bishop out it's just like well I'm gonna castle my king that's the that's the fundamental yeah. um, idea that's what they told me to do so I think that's a big part of it is that they just think that you have to do these couple of steps at the very beginning in order to get get to that point um, so that that was a very very good game by you overall just try to remember those pawns so. Let's let's take a look at this last one as well. Um, can I advise you to this one? Uh, right. That one. Oh, that was a scary one. Yeah. So okay. So e4, e5, bishop c4. Okay. All pretty normal. Very good. Ah, yes. And Forsen played this move. Yeah. Forsen likes the gambits. Um. Okay. So yeah. This, no. No wonder this was scary. Yeah. Since I haven't seen this game, I totally see why it was. Um. So the thing is. When you're when when people try to push, there are a couple options to push this pawn here. When your opponent pushes the pawn here, um, in a situation like this where you haven't castled your king yet, you do not want to capture with your pawn. Hmm. Okay. So the correct move would be bishop takes pawn. Ah. Oh. And when mm. I capture, which way do you capture back? I take with knight, right? Good. Very good. Right. So because so then I is... keep the pawn there. Right, so this is probably what Forsen would have done, I assume, and he would have pushed this pawn here. Ah, oh, oh that, yeah, that's that's actually rough. Uh, I guess I would play d6. Yeah, 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 I yeah, know. Of course, that's that that's probably the only move here that that doesn't where you don't end up in a lot of trouble. 
Um, and now in, in this sort of position, it's much different. I don't think this will happen, but let's just say it does. I'll give you a few more moves. It's normally after takes, um, white will play like bishop here. And what you do, what, what's happening is white has given up one pawn. White sacrifices pawn with his pawn push in return for really fast development by bringing out the pieces, uh, like bringing out this bishop and this bishop and castling the king. And he also has a nice open file for his f uh, rook, I guess. A half right. open file. Right, so what I'm going to recommend that you play is you move this bishop here. Probably. Mm. And, and the point is, in this situation, like, you, would, do you want to castle your king here? Not really, right? Like, he has a lot of threats towards uh, that, and he's going to ruin my pawn structure in a moment. Right, so White will probably take and do something like Queen H5 or Knight C3, Knight C5, Queen H5. There are a lot of threats because yeah. your King is very open. Yeah, exactly. So I and like I can't take back the Queen because it's Rook gone. So since you moved the pawn. Right. So what you want to do in a situation like this is look to the other side of the board. Since since there are all these mm. open lines, you want to develop your Bishop. Let's just say I move my Bishop back, and you actually want to go the other way this time. So yeah, you can so play something I'd like play... Queen E seven, or sorry, yeah, 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 Queen E seven, and then uh, castle long. Right, because in a position like this, once you castle, you see your king is very safe behind this wall of pawns here. Nothing is open. Yeah, yeah, and also I have a like a decent threat against the queen uh, once I move my, uh, oh, like a pin on the bishop when I move my knight. Right, and and, and and you're also up one pawn here as well. Oh yeah, that's true. So just stabilizing is fine. Right, so so that that's what that's the thing, and also the reason that most of the time you end up castling to the to the king side to the um to the, to the left of the king is because most of the time in the opening there there are a lot of pawn pushes on the queen side. So so like normally white pushes the C and D pawns and the E pawn. So when you're pushing all the pawns on one side of the board normally, uh, you castle to the king side. That's that's normally normally why you don't castle to the queen side that often. But in a situation like this, where your opponent gambits a pawn to attack right away, you, you actually can castle here, because neither side has moved any of these pawns. So white doesn't, so there's no attack here on this side of the board. Yeah, that's true. And then I can start pushing my pawns on the uh, Right, well, it's like when, when, when white takes, for example, this is actually very good for black. Because even yeah, though you have these pawns, what does this allow you to do now? Let me just play a random move. I get, get my rogue on the G file. Exactly, uh, yeah. So yeah, basically can... not even just one rook, you can just move both rooks and, and put a lot oh, of pressure. Yeah. And that's some it's very hard for him to defend. Yeah, I mean already this pretty... is really, really bad for white. Like uh I, I mean I, I'd probably just resign if I was white here, if I was playing another grandmaster. <laughs> so 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 yeah, that's mm. the thing also is like when you think about these pawns, they they can be generally they can be weaknesses, but if they give you like an open open file, like in this case, down towards your opponent's king, it's very, very good. Um, so like that's why. But what if he doesn't take? Would you try to force it with the h6? Yeah. Well, I guess like yeah, in Grandmaster course. games they would never take that if I cast a queen side though. Well, I mean this wouldn't, wouldn't happen know. because it's already close to lost. White's yeah. already basically <laughs> losing the game here. Um, so like so like yeah, if I just play like a normal move, you would you would just push the pawn, of course. Try to um, ah. and now when he goes back because you castle the king to the other side. You don't mind. You can you can just start pushing your pawns because also with you want to attack towards the white king here. Yeah, exactly. That's gonna be a huge threat. So yeah, so like normally if, if you like if your king was on this side on like on g8, then you never really want to push the pawns in front of the king with all the pieces on the board. But because the king has gone the other way, um, you, you you don't you don't mind. You you want to attack because when there's when you have opposite side castling or one side goes to the left and one goes to the right. Very often times the players will go into an all out attack towards the opponent's king. Because since the kings are opposite sides, you just push everything on the opposite sides to try and attack your opponent's king. Yeah, and then it's all about tempo. Right. So 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 this is this is what you should have done because I mean the problem is if you don't know, of course, then then this looks like a very natural move. Um and now I'm curious here, this is probably too hard, but Try to find a move that is not a knight move here. I want to see if you can find a move that's not a knight move that's a good move here. A move that's not so, a knight So move. I'm saying leave, leave your knight under attack, and I want to see if you can find a yeah. good move. I, I, would, I would think uh, for d7 to d5 then. But no, then he takes... 
I take and then you take. Oh my... Wow. Wow, I'm I kind of speechless. I did not expect you to come up with that in like two seconds. Um yeah. No, D5 D5 is, is the correct move. 100 percent uh, I did see it in the I did see it in the game. Uh but I felt like him uh, if we trade doesn't mm -hmm. he, like his pawn on uh, G G7 at the end of it is gonna be very scary. I guess he can. can, can. No, no, he can. Yeah. So, so like, like this doesn't matter because this won't happen. But just so you have some idea, like, so once again, when you look at this position, ma material is even here. But you're never gonna be yeah. able to castle your king to the king side, um, because there's just a pawn here and you move the rook. Uh. So, so like. What you do here is the same thing. You look to go the other way because you also have these these Ooh. sort of pawns in the center. Yeah, so what what you can do is just move the bishop. Yeah, I think queen out as well and then castle long and then. But I I just in the game I couldn't see myself dealing yeah. with the g seven pawn uh, pawn for such a long time because yeah. it's gonna be very hard to remove, right? Yeah, I, I mean, play, like, like I was, like, what I'm showing, this does not matter at all. Like, don't, don't worry about this. This, this is just so you have some idea of what could have happened. Um, but no, yeah, I would, no, I would I not did, I did see this. it, but I, I, I couldn't fight. Like, yeah. then I would have to spend a lot of moves trying to move my knight, and yeah. I wouldn't be able to get my king out of center, and he could put even more pressure. Right, so actually, actually, like, the reason this is okay is because you can, you, like, this is just a general thing. It, it doesn't matter um, uh. to this game. But even though the bishop is very good and protects the pawn, what you can also do here first is you can move your queen. Ah, oh, hitting both, yeah. So um, if you move the bishop, the pawn is under attack. And then when I just like defend, yeah. you can keep going with your development by moving the bishop and then castling the king this way. Oh yeah, I didn't plug any checks. Yeah, and, and I mean this this is very good, but but again, it doesn't matter. I'm just showing you just so just so, just so you know, but it, it has yeah, no, yeah, no it's, effect it's... and I would not recommend it. The, the main thing is that though in this position, like, um, is that in this position going back, you don't take with the pawn. Yeah, I simply just don't take. I take yeah. with the minor piece instead. Right, because and now let's he... mm -hmm. But if he, like, pushes pawn up, I just go back, right? Like, if he tries to push his uh, C pawn or something to do uh, attack my bishop, I just move back. That's, yeah, that's if, no if white pushes the pawn, um, there are a couple things you can do here. I'm trying to think what's the simplest, um, as a suggestion. Probably what I would recommend is um, is that you push this pawn here, actually. Mm. And so when white pushes the pawn, you drop the bishop back. Ah, yeah, okay. And then just retake. Right, so, 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 tickets. so, hmm, well, let me think. Is there a better way to do this? Let me think. Because this is, this is pretty complicated. I'm just trying to think there's some simpler, simpler <laughs> solution. I mean, actually, you know, on pawn push, maybe just capture this one. Ah, and then when white pushes, ah. push the pawn. Are oh, both defending and attacking, and yeah. Right, because you you also guard your knight at the same time by pushing the pawn. So this is what I would recommend you do, and then if white just moves the bishop, uh, just capture and then drop the bishop back and castle your king next move. Yeah, and then I have some very good lines towards this king as well. Right. So so I think I think that's what I recommend now. Um, before you get to the game, there is one other, one other option that your opponent could play in the opening, which they can move the knight. You move the knight, and they can push this pawn. So this yeah. is called the, the scotch scotch opening. And now here you see you you, you can't take with the knight because on the pawn here will hang. If you take, he just takes your pawn. Yeah, and then I have to spend a move going back as well. Right. So so when you take the pawn, they can play this move. And then I play uh, f5. No, no, no. A no, bishop no. f5? No? Yeah, bishop c5, you mean? Right, but so, so yeah, like, C5's do, do you see what's going to happen, though, in white castles? Like, if you move your knight out, I push my pawn. Yeah. And we're back in the same position as before. Oh, that's true, and I can't take. No. Right, so th this is like, this is, <clears throat> this is the same position as before, but from a different order. So, like, mm. in, in, in your game, when he played this, you could have taken with the bishop and the knight. You didn't have to take with the pawn. But I played yeah, it in a different order, it. where I forced you to take on move two, and then I played bishop here. Ah, oh, that's very clever, yeah. Yeah, so this, so, if, if this happens, what I'm gonna recommend that you play is still play bishop here, they castle, and now just push this pawn. 
Ah, yeah, to avoid the pawn push. Right, so now your idea is to bring the knight. There's no pawn push, but also if you need to, you can bring your bishop out right away as well. Oh, yeah. That's a way better idea, for sure. <laughs> right, so th this is only if, if someone looks and they try to trick you with this move order by pushing the pawn on move two. But if it happens, just remember that if it's done before this bishop move, um, before this bishop move, you bring your bishop out and then you push this pawn right away. I did some scouting on Forsen, but he had only played like 50 games on that uh, account. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for me to find uh, find these openings from him. So I I only saw him play E4 uh, uh, Knight F3. So yeah, I just, no. I, I, what are you gonna do? Yeah, basically Forsen. Um, I had like he he likes Gambit, so he either had to play like the, the Evans Gambit or he had to play sort of the Scotch Max Lang opening like he did against you. Um, so those are really the, the only two options um mm. let me see if there's anything else of relevance in this game okay rookie one you played 97 that's fine c3 d5 ah so you did play d5 in the game you oh got yeah it i did uh, yeah nice. yeah i did play it after i moved my knight though very nice okay so he took bishop b4 very good move uh because you attack the you attack the bishop and then you attack the rook so what it you yeah. were losing somehow though right because you made some mistake i thought I, I I I got the uh, stuck in a bad position, right? With his pawn pushes, I believe, like with his center, something mm -hmm. like that. So 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 this again, basically another one of the most fundamental concepts when you play these um these e4 e5 openings is that here you can bring your bishop out. Ah. Because now you see the problem. What happens when the knight moves? When the knight moves, then, uh... Uh... My... I don't... I don't... See this one there, like he's gonna do a pawn? No. Oh! Oh, I can take the pawn, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of, uh... But he would just let it be, but then, like... Right, it would but be he very can't, hard for him he, to capture back. Yeah, he can't he let can't it capture. be in, in, a, in a normal way. Because if you move the bishop, you just take. And now he's the yeah. double pawns. Yeah, double pawns and uh, open file against this king. Right, so what you would do here is at some point, actually you would try to open it up by pushing this pawn to attack down towards these pawns. Ah, oh, yeah. So so that's just a general thing. Not a big deal. But, but yeah, probably the thing is always be aware of these ideas. Um, when their pawns like very advanced in the center like on e5 and, and d4 e4 and d5 just be aware of these ideas to try and attack these pawns Yeah, that makes sense like to remove the defender Right, so all this was still good Very good. You played bishop g4. Aha. He found this trick Yeah, yeah, yeah. One... Uh, okay mm -hmm. Oh Yeah, no this this was unfortunate because up to this point you played a very very good game. Um, but the problem, of course, is why it's threatening to push the pawn and win your win your rook here. Yeah. So there, there. Th this is very hard to find. But the best move would have been to actually retreat with the bishop, because you st you still guard this pawn. Oh, and yeah, now my rook has more freedom. Right. When he pushes, you just bring the rook over, and then when he moves the queen, you just move your queen and bring the other rook, and you just try to play on this open e file. Oh yeah, I di didn't see that line at all. <laughs> Right, it's it's not a big deal, but yeah, it's just just something. Um, but yeah. he played it really well, though. Like he saw everything except for the last move of this one. Right, yeah, because at this point, yeah, he could have just played bishop takes knight, and it's just just winning for white. Yeah, exactly. But, but he luckily, the queen trade made him. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but after this, it's already probably. It's better for white, but it's hard to play. And and again, so when we reach this position, what what do we call this? This knight, what, what, do you know this uh, term? Outpost. Yeah, you've got the outpost because the bishop is dark square, so it can never attack, and the pawn just supports, so uh. the rook can never attack the knight either. So you, so yeah. at this point, it's it's completely fine. So here, just some end game. Um, yeah, again, good concepts. Again, creating this this uh, sort of pawn chain. And now, now again, if white can't attack the pawn here, then it, the, all the pawns are very stable. They protect each other. And the bishop is dark yeah. squared, so it can never go behind and attack. Pawns are on the opposite color square. Okay, this is 
good. Right, rookie four, very good move, by the way, because of the double attack. Yeah. Uh, very good. Very, very good. I felt very stuck after this once he put his bishop on uh, EV3. Like, I felt like there was no way of me getting my rook in action, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, so, so rook b3, knight takes e3, takes b5. Um, What I was going to say here is it's kind of tricky, but probably the best way to play this is to go um, is to go pawn to b5. Hmm, all right. Because now, like, white white has to go back, right? Because this is the way that I, this is the way that I attack. Because yeah. I can't go this way to attack this one because the knight holds the pawn. So rook a3. But, uh, mm -hmm. but what, how would I defend it? You actually don't defend the pawn. You try you try to attack. So so one thing that's that is important here um, in end games is to with rooks especially try to um, try to make them active pieces rather than passive pieces. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Because so, right now it's eyeing down the pawn, and that's why I wanted to do the uh, the uh, trade for the bishop for uh, for knight, so I could win the. Uh pawn on the default right first. right of course if he captures the rook then you take the pawn um so, so right. then just very quickly you could you could have played check and gone rook here i think i go that at some point oh yeah maybe you did um but anyway that's just what i would have recommended <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't really right. matter the only problem is when you reach this position is that now um white can play rook c3 yeah and now, now you're gonna yeah. lose this pawn on c6 and he has to pass pawn well, not only just a pass pawn, he's gonna uh, have two connected. Pass pawn. He's gonna have two connected oh, yeah. pass pawns. So, like, let's say we reach this end game, for example, just so you see it. Um, this end game is really, really bad for Black because I have two mm. pawns that can march down the board, and you really can't stop both of them. So, in an end game, no, if you get true. two, like, if you get two connected pass pawns in an end game, um, you just try to use push them up the board as fast as you can because your opponent probably cannot stop. Uh, cannot stop the two pawns yeah they, they can always protect each other uh, basically if i try to attack with the rook right so let, let's say i push the pawn you go here here pawn here rook here um and then, again it doesn't matter because the two pawns your two pawns are faster or white's two pawns i mean because there's check and you just push these pawns they're only three squares away from queening whereas black is one two three but then this one is one two three four so I'm not going to go through the yeah. whole line, but the thing is, when you get two connected pass pawns, the general rule is that you can't stop both of the pass pawns. Yeah, not with only like one active piece or like one rook. Right. So, so in general, just that's another thing is if you reach like these what we call rook and pawn end games, where both sides only have one rook. If one side ever gets two pawns that are unimpeded that can just go straight up the board, it's almost always winning for for, mm. for that side. Yeah. So anyway, force him to play king f2, king d5, rook h1. Actually, very good move here because now you're down a pawn. But also, when you look at this, this is another thing I'd point out. White is up one pawn versus the material being even. But here, there's only one pass pawn rule. Well, I mean, technically, technically, I uh -huh. mean, there's only one pass pawn. This could become one, but your pawn actually always capture. So it's it's much better than the other version, even though you're down a pawn here, because white does not get yeah. two pawns just rolling up the board. So here, g5, rook b1, very good move. Rook b2, excellent move. What? So like, I, I'm sure you, you you obviously didn't understand why this is a, this is the perfect move. But when I say it's an excellent move, um, why do you think that I say it's an excellent move? Because it, take uh, his uh, his rook is stuck to defending the uh, a2 uh, a2 pawn for now, and now my king is in the center, being gonna be able to. Uh, to help yeah. out faster than the uh, the white king yeah so um basically this is the best move for a couple of reasons first of all you you the rook is tied to the pawn secondly you can't push the pawn because this pawn is tied to this pawn on b3 yeah but then the third reason is that white can't really use the king to come into the game because your rook also attacks this pawn on g2 oh yeah that's true yeah as soon as he moves to king i can take that pawn and i still keep the pressure on the a pawn anyway yeah, so this is like, I mean, just a perfect move. King f3, you played this move, which by the way, um, what, what, what I would what I would have suggested is that you push this one. Mm. And, because and if he takes, I take the pawn with check. 
right. And if he goes back, you can you can defend the pawn. Because the problem is when you actually push this pawn, you see how you have a this is what we call a pawn majority. You have two pawns on this side against yeah. one. But he can actually go pawn here. And now your majority oh. becomes fixed permanently where you can no longer push the pawn. This one can't go forward. This one can't go forward either. Yeah, so they're stuck, yeah. So the one pawn kind of, it's it stops the two pawns from, from moving up the board. Ah. Yeah. So so this is just something in general. Is if you think about positions where it's like two versus one or three versus two, um, if you have the opportunity where you can prevent your opponent's majority from moving up the board, it's very, very important that you do that. Because like, for example, let's say, let's say you get this position. You see the pawns are still flexible. I can still push either pawn up the board. Like if you push this one, I go yeah. here and they're flexible. Um, but like in this situation, you can you can fix this pawn, which is which is backwards to this pawn, and um, and the one pawn just controls the two. So even yeah, I, I don't know why I one, actually the played the b4. It. Yeah. Well, like it's, it's, b4. Well, yeah. No, but actually, it's it's not crazy because you do the same thing on the other side. You fix this pawn now permanently to this square, so your pawn kind of prevents these two pawns mm. from going up the board. But don't I want him to kind of go a little up uh, up the board so I could take on B3? Right. The, the reason the reason is that basically nothing is moving here. It's all very static on this side of the board. So you should you should worry about your majority over here because these pawns aren't going anywhere. Nah. One of them is going to be under attack. But the idea of this move is not bad. Is all I'm saying. Ah, okay. Yeah, but but it's just that your rook kind of it stops the pawns from moving at the moment, so you don't need to worry about that. Yeah, I think I did it as a filler uh, move, most of all, just to see what he would do, because I couldn't get my king in here, mm -hmm. uh, and, like, his, he couldn't move his rook, and his king cannot, like, really get anywhere either, so I wanted to see what he was going to do, maybe he was going to move the rook or something, Right. and then I could take. Yeah, no, but it's fine, I just, just was pointing that out, so, anyway, you played this very Oh, that's good. what he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so he tried to go for the pawns, which is okay, except for the fact that... Um, when you reach end games, the thing that matters a lot is whose pawn is closer to queening as well. And your pawn is yeah. much more advanced than white's pawn. So even if white has like an extra two or three pawns, your pawn is much closer to the end of the board. And yeah, that queen. was what I was seeing as uh, as well. Like, and if he does push the D uh, D pawn, I can just take. Right. So you played this. He played D five, D three. Um, now I think this is pro. Is this winning? This is probably winning for white. Maybe E five, D six. Very, very hard to tell. Um, he played this. He went here. King C two. Very good move, by the way. Um, let me see. What is this winning or not? No, it's not. Okay. Um, so here, force him play D six, which is which is not the correct move. So so what what someone tries to do when one player has one pawn going up the board like this is try to use these pass pawns together to make a queen. Um, mm, yeah. So probably Force and should have tried something like this um, and try to push these pawns up the board together. And I, I don't know if yeah, this, wor this works, but it's what I would have suggested. It would have been hard for me to find the moves in time uh, mm -hmm. as well. I right. And my king is very far away. Exactly. So so I mean, this is what he should have done, but he played d6 and, and, and now you played here and he pushed his pawn, which is a big mistake. Because already, the, the funny thing is at this point, you're, you're not even really worse. Because if he tries to push the pawn, you go here and you capture the pawn. Um, yeah, exactly. And he can't push this pawn because that puts the king in check. So he can't connect the two pawns and use the two pawns together to go up the board and make a queen. So he goes here, you play rook d3, perfect move. And now, yeah, and it just game ends in a draw and, and you won the match. So overall, I mean, what, what I would say is just in, in general, in this game, there was maybe that opening phase. Just be a little bit careful, just, just about piece placement generally speaking in the opening before your king is castled when you like the let, let me go through the game um is that when you bring the knight out if you're castled these ideas of this pawn push are not super effective but if your king is still in the center you need to be very careful about white making some gambit where white will push the pawn yeah. and attack the knight uh, didn't i just push it back though what what did i do I, I, you, you, you went I back you went back okay. yeah yeah now now the reason Wasn't that I move like f4 or something stuff uh, which move? Uh, not f4. Uh, g4. So. Yeah, you, you can move the knight to this square also. Um, I, I think here it might might just be wrong because white can take, and after takes they go knight g5 check. 
because they're gonna win. They're gonna win your uh, knight on g4 oh. here. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think the yeah. main thing is when you're playing e4, these pawn openings with pawn in front of the king. Uh, you want to be very careful of these moves. So let's just say white plays a move like this and you castle. The move here is still fine, but it has very little effectiveness. You can just move your knight away. And next move, yeah. you're going to push the pawn and bring the bishop into the game. But if your king is not castled, um, then it's very, very dangerous. That's actually, yeah, in most of my games, I do not castle in time. That's actually true. I try to win so hard early that uh, I actually end up not castling in time. And that's very important with the Spanish as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's 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 what that's that's what I would say. Is just be mindful of um, be mindful of this. But but in general, I, I think I mean you you're very good at understanding these concepts. You're you're doing very well um, in the tournament. And ma mainly, I think it's just like maybe maybe just try to firm up your openings a little bit more, just so you can get to the middle game. Because it seems like your understanding is very very good. Yeah, like it's definitely just the openings. I need to learn a little bit more about like when to actually push in the center and uh, when I can bring in like uh, mm -hmm. uh, the pawn push when everything else is defended. And I have castle. Right, right. But yeah, o overall though, you're you're doing great. I mean, you're just like your understanding is really, really good. So I, I think it's mainly just make sure you understand some of the concepts in the opening phase so you don't get tricked like what happened yesterday against Forreston. And if you get out of the opening yeah. phase without being in a lot of trouble, um, you're going to do very well. Because you're understanding these middle game ideas, just understanding sort of where the pieces belong and seeing these tactile patterns um, is, is just fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, my next game is going to be against Carson, I believe. Correct. But that's yeah. going to be an in interesting one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Carson is, is, is a bit bit newer um, to the game, but I, I think mainly it's just like, if you avoid making big mistakes, and I think this applies to pr probably anyone that you're going to play against, except maybe Wagamama, who, who maybe maybe you'll play against like once you're in the bracket phase. But um, for the most part, I feel like you're, you're just, you're playing very, very good chess. Just if you, if you avoid these big mistakes where you lose like knights or, or rooks or queens, um, you're, you're going to go very far. Yeah, I, I hope so, at least. Uh, Hafu also is one of uh, the ones that I think about is going to be a very, very tough opponent for me. She has just been grinding. Right, but the good news is, I mean, you have a few more days to do preparations just to keep trying to study, keep improving um, before even the, the bracket stage. So I think I think yeah. I, I would just recommend looking a little bit more at your openings um, and probably doing, do, doing some puzzles as well, would, I think would be important because like the way that you're remembering these ideas i think if you see certain ideas and puzzles it's really going to help you um once once we're in we're in the final final phase of it yeah like that is definitely a, yeah i do a lot of puzzles <laughs> yeah no, i mean you're you're definitely like you're, you're showing your strength i think yeah as long as you just relax you don't get nervous um you're, you're gonna go far so um, well yeah. thank you i i'm very excited <laughs> Great, great. Well, I, I actually kind of have to get going because I have an actual tournament that I have to play in like 20 minutes. So, oh, um, uh, no of... worries, no worries. I'm going to go get dinner as well. So. Oh, right. Yeah, it's, it's quite, it's pretty late there. Yeah, it's, like it's 20 to 7. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that lesson and um, just, just let I me know. Did. Let me know if you want more, especially going forward once you're, once you're, once you're in the bracket and yeah, the, I think... the real fun begins. Yeah, I think once I'm out of the group stage, I would love to like go a little more in depth. And I think mm -hmm. in those matches is mostly going to be like how you manage the end game because there's not going to be many big blunders right uh where you just get a free piece so i think it's uh, like how you manage your end game and how you win with a, like a small lead of a, like one or two pawns yeah no de definitely but yeah just just let me know if you want some help and uh and i'll ah, be available thank you yeah yeah thank you so much for your time good luck with yeah, your tournament no problem all right hope you enjoyed it have a great rest of your stream